The underlying trigger for appendicitis happening is the obstruction of the appendix lumen. This can happen due to various reasons. However, the most common is as a result of faecalifs becoming lodged in the lumen. Faecalifs are essentially hard bits of faeces. But because we like to make things sound more impressive, we use the term faecalif, which translates as stone of faeces. The other causes of luminal obstruction include infections, lymphoid hyperplasia, in particularly in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease, and especially important in developing countries are parasitic infections, which can also block the appendix. And the last cause on our list is particularly important in older patients, and it's tumours of the cecum, which as they grow, may cause obstruction of the opening of the appendix. In this picture, we can see excellently demonstrated a removed appendix which has a small incision in its side wall, and this allows us to see the faecal lift that has caused the blockage in the first place. And if you look closely, you can see the inflammation of the appendix which is distal to this blockage. As we mentioned earlier, appendicitis is more rare in extremes of ages. And the reason for this is to do with the size of the appendix orifice. Now when we're born, this opening into the appendix lumen is really wide, which means that it's very rare for any faecal lift to become stuck. And on the flip side of this, in very elderly individuals, the orifice is much more narrow than it is during adolescence. Thus, making it really difficult for any faecal lifts to gain entry to the lumen at all. But what happens after the appendix gets blocked? Well, firstly, the intraluminal pressure distal to the blockage increases. This rising pressure starts to prevent the return of blood via the small veins, causing venous congestion. As this venous congestion continues to increase, the pressure being placed upon the appendix walls eventually increases beyond the pressure of the arterioles. And therefore, arteriolar flow decreases, the appendix becomes ischemic, gangrenous, and then eventually it will perforate. So hopefully that's a bit more clear now. The classical description, which is very accurate in helping us distinguish appendicitis from other differential diagnoses, is that the patient develops a vague periombolical pain initially. Over the next 24 to 48 hours, this pain then becomes localised to the right iliac fossa, typically around McBurney's point. As well as pain, the patient may also complain of anorexia and vomiting. However, it's important to try and clarify from their history as to the order of the onset of these symptoms, as vomiting that occurs prior to the onset of abdominal pain is usually indicative of gastroenteritis rather than appendicitis. Regarding the patient's bowels, this doesn't really help us too much, as the inflammation of the appendix can cause irritation in the adjacent colon, leading to diarrhoea. But, at the other end of the spectrum, it may actually result in the bowels developing an ileus, so the patient may describe having not passed any flatus or faeces at all. As we've already mentioned, the position of the appendix base is typically found around McBurney's point. However, there is a relatively high variability in the position of the appendix tip. The majority of the time, the appendix is located in a retrocecal position, so it lies behind the cecum. In 20% of cases, the tip lies in the patient's pelvis. The remaining possible positions are pretty rare, with paracecal and subsecal making up 2 and 1.5% respectively. And pre ileal and post ileal making up 1 and 0.5%. But why do we actually care where the tip lies? Well, the reason we care is that the location and the type of symptoms and signs that the patient experiences is often dependent on where the position of this tip lies.